great talk. And uh, is using GoPresent, and it's a very, very nice tool. And uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll sit down because I'll actually run my presentation. You'll see in a while. Ah. So my name is uh, Siu Yin. I work for a tiny consulting firm, Beyond Broadcast, and we write back-end servers for broadcast operations. But anyway, the, the purpose of my talk is this hype about microservices. Um, how do we get there? And how do the services talk to each other? In the beginning, there was the monolith. And this is a monolith. Um, like any Go program, you have a main package declaration, which means this package runs. And I've declared a function called sum. And all it does is add two numbers, return A plus B. That's all it does. So let's run this presentation. And A plus B is seven. Ha! Huh. Is there a trick? No, it's not a trick. Let me close this. I'm going to change this number. Let's change it to three or two. So I must change this as well. The sum of three and two is five. Wow, it's live. What's happening here? My browser is talking to a Go backend. This Go code is actually being compiled on the fly. So it really feels like a scripting language. And it's presented on the browser. Uh, program exited means it's finished the program run. Now, there's absolutely nothing at all wrong with monoliths. Uh, I started my career writing backends in monoliths. Um, and I always feel that things that are related should be together. Birds of a feather should flock together. So nothing wrong with monoliths. But there are issues as well. So let's see what monoliths cannot do. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is RPC, Remote Procedure Call. In the Go standard library, there is a net RPC package. It's there for you to use. Uh, to use it properly, you should actually define your own package. I don't like typing, so I call it nRPC for net RPC. And I export a few structures. For those of you new to Go, you see these strange uppercase things. Uppercase is significant. It means the world can see it. It's exported. So this structure contains two elements, A and B, which are also exported. And they are integers. And I have an arithmetic uh, type, which is a synonym to integer. So arithmetic is the same as integer. I do that for a very interesting purpose because I can declare a method on the arithmetic type. So I'm declaring a method on the arithmetic type, and that's how you declare a method in Go. So all it does is sum argument A plus argument B and return nil because Go allows you to return error values as well. So return nil for error means everything is fine. So how do you write a net RPC server? Well, for one, you use my net RPC package, which was what you just saw in the previous slide. You register it with the proper RPC package, not net RPC. Handle HTTP because, well, it actually talks HTTP in the background. And listen to port 1234. If everything is fine, don't do anything. If something went wrong, if there was an error, show an error message. Run the server and wait forever. Select open brace, close brace means wait forever. So let's run the server. It's compiling. Why is my machine so slow during the presentation? Server's running. So let's look at the client. Uh, let me 
me get my mouse out of the way. All the client does really is make a phone call to port 1234, dial using HTTP protocol. If the phone call was successful, it says nothing. If it fails, log an error message. Declare my arguments. Here's my net RPC package again. I'm going to use arguments 3 and 4. And I'm going to call it with the arithmetic.sum uh, <laughs> method. And I'm, the result will be stored in the reply. Remember, I, this ampersand here is I pass a reference to reply, so I can actually write into reply. And I should see the usual answer. Let's run the client. Yep, the sum of 3 and 4 is 7. Fair enough. So, what did we gain by jumping around and jumping through all those hoops? What did we gain, really? The, really, the thing we really gained was separations, separation of concerns. The client is responsible for the front end, the UI, and the server for the back end. More importantly, the server or the client can be independently updated without bringing down the whole system. If you had a monolith, you had to take down the monolith, recompile, replace the monolith binary. Not so with RPC. Furthermore, one server can serve many, many clients. Right? If it is CPU-like, that means it doesn't use a lot of CPU, one server could potentially serve thousands of clients. On the other hand, if you're doing video encoding, the reverse could be true. Many servers can serve a few clients. Right? But you need uh, load balances for that. So what we have really gained is independent scalability. We can scale the client and the server independently. And independent deployment as well. So when I was young, I heard there was this product from Ericsson that five nines of reliability. How could that be? That's the answer. Different parts which you can update independently. So the costs are additional complexity and the second one is a killer. The network. The network generally is unreliable. Don't trust the network. So that's the big cost you pay but go in with your eyes open and you'll be fine. So multiple servers must be served behind a load balancer, which I didn't talk about. And in this particular case, with NetRPC, both the client and the server must be written in Go. Because behind the scenes, it uses Go native serialization. I like to think that the server and the client are very tightly coupled in this case. So there's tight coupling, which is sometimes a bad thing. My favorite pattern, though, is message bus. So what is a message bus? The concept is quite simple. A message bus is a whiteboard. Ooh. Am I still online? OK. Message bus is a whiteboard. And it has different topics. Jobs. Applicants, anybody with the, pretend, with the correct credentials can write to the whiteboard. And the whole world, you can see it. And this is very interesting because I have a job A. Applicants interested, some client can make use of this information and do something with it. So let's demonstrate the message bus pattern. So the first thing I need to do is I need to start a message broker. Uh, my current favorite message broker is called Nets, N-A-T-S. You can find out more about it from nets.io. Um, and it's a Go binary. So it's a very small five, six megabyte binary, I think. So I just run the message broker and it's now listening on port 4222. And the server's ready, that's it. That's a message broker. Run a single binary, up and, up and running. 
I declare a package just like I did for NRPC. It's now called MBUS. Make sure I don't trip over my wire. I declare more or less the same thing, except that I declare a constant. It's a string. The package has a constant called errorth sum and errorth dot sum. So effectively, what I'm doing is I have another topic. So that is my topic. It's just a string. Uh, excuse me. All right. So in order to run a client, you need to go get the GoNets package. And let me walk through this code with you. It connects to localhost for triple two. That is a generic connection that can pass any serialization in the world. Up to you. Uh, you can use GOP, you can use protocol buffers, anything. NETS comes with JSON encoding built in. So I like to use JSON, it's human readable, slow, but doesn't matter. So that's an encoded connection. So now from the generic connection, I've got an encoded connection. And I subscribe to a RUTH sum. In other words, I look at this topic. I look at this topic. And I pass to it a function, a lambda. What the lambda does is it's got a subject, it's got reply, it's got arguments, and as input parameters. And what the function does is one thing. It publishes a re into reply as a reply type, arx A plus arx B. Yeah, adds up two things. So and it waits forever. This, this server waits forever. I won't run the server right now. Let's talk through what it does. So, with the encoder connection, subscribe to the subject, handle messages, and reply, post it back to this reply string, which I passed in. So, in other words, NETS actually creates a temporary reply topic on the whiteboard, my message, the client will actually write to this. So let's run the server and see what it does. Message server running, message bus server running. Now look at the client. The client is essentially the same thing. It connects to the message broker. It makes a request and prints it out. And running the presentation, the sum of three and four is seven. Ah, no big deal. Okay, what have we gained? What have we gained by going to a message bus? So as I said, NETS allows any type of encoding. If you want protocol buffers, go ahead, use it. Um, you can cancel requests if you want. There's a request with context. Ah. Ah. Okay. Excuse me. <coughs> His battery went flat. I think my battery went dead. No worries. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, it was easy, I mean, getting in here was a lot of hassle, but it is difficult for it to bring you guys to leave here. Okay, rest. Rest is abused a lot. I'll jump over it quickly. REST, in spirit, deals with resources. <coughs> Create a resource, update a resource, delete a resource. This is not a good fit for REST because this is not a resource. This is an addition operation. But anyway, when we talk about REST, we talk about JSON encoding, we talk about HTTP. So in order for you to run REST, you effectively have to encode your values uh, in some sort of encoding. 
here I'm using URL encoding so that I can actually get slash sum question mark A equals 3, B equals 4. That sort of thing. Um, the good thing with Go is the web server is built in. So let's run the web server. Yes, the REST server is running. And to process the parameters, you're dealing with strings. You have A to I, string to integer conversion. Yucks. Yes, you can use a library which hides all this from you. But I'm showing you all the dirty linen. You're dealing with strings. And you're doing all these nasty conversions. But Go has the libraries to do the conversions for you. So let's run the client because I'm, I'm running through so that we can get to the better part, gRPC. So 3 and 4, HTTP, no big deal. Um, I can change the parameters. Uh, 7 and 4. And it's 11. Of course, I didn't change the thing below. All right. So what, what is gained by going to REST? REST is, or JSON API, is the most popular API method ever. So you have to know, you have to know this. However, the message bus pattern is a lot more lightweight. How lightweight? If you use a library like 0MQ, a laptop like this, an obsolete laptop like this, can do about a million messages per second. With NATS, it drops about 100,000. With REST, you're very lucky if you can get away with 10,000 requests per second. Very lucky. So, message bus arguments can be directly encoded in the, in the protocol of your preference. So, REST servers in general, are more resource intensive. You run through strings, it runs through all that overhead. But the good thing about it is the embedded HTTP server with Go. You don't need additional uh, code or uh, additional server. So let's go to gRPC, which is the focus of this talk. gRPC was released by Google um, from an internal project they call Stubby. NetRPC only supports Go, Go-to-Go -go communication. gRPC supports many languages. You want Go? Fine. It talks to Ruby, it talks to Python, it talks to Java, C Sharp, C++. It generates program stops. I'll demonstrate that in a while. It is a binary protocol that runs over HTTP2 with persistent connections, which means it can support streaming as well. So it is a super duper <coughs> net RPC. And it has contact support, so it can cancel. Yes? What's the numbers? Numbers? How many messages a second? Oh, <laughs> I, I think gRPC would be about off the order of the same as REST, okay. huh? slightly between 10,000 and 100,000. Rather slow than faster. Uh, slower than faster. It's, sl it's slower than Nets. It's slower than Nets. So if you are performance freak, write in 0MQ. CERN ac accepted 0MQ so they can analyze that billions of data uh, so that's fast. Anyway, how do you set up gRPC? It's quite involved. You need to go get a package. No big deal. You need to download the Proto C compiler, Proto compiler from this location, which is a Go binary, it's a single binary. And then you need to go and get the Proto C generator for the Go stubs. If you are using Java, you need the Proto, Proto generator for Java. Now, remember I wrote a nRPC package and type arithmetic, you don't write that for gRPC. Instead, you write this thing, which looks very much like what we have written before. This uses 
protocol buffers level 3, version 3. The package name is called Arithmetic, A-R-I-T-H. I expose a service called Arith, and it sums two integers. It's an RPC, sum, that accepts sum args, type sum args, and returns a sum reply. And sum args is a message type with in 32, can be float 32, can be complex. It does this so that everybody that talks to gRPC knows exactly the size and the endian. A and B are parameters. Equals 1 and equals 2 are not what you think. They are tags. They are saying some args has in position number 1 the, the structure A. In position number 2, structure B or item B. Some reply in position number 1 has an in 32 called reply. And it does this for good reasons. So that when you have different generations of your interface file, as long as the tags don't conflict, you're fine, you're good. So this is very well thought out. But you can't do anything with that file. You need to compile it. So Proto-C, that is the file which I created, output into this folder. Let's run the compilation step. Oops. So there it is, April 3rd, arithpb.go. This file is generated by Proto-C from that interface definition file just now. So let's go and look inside this file. What does it do? Well, nothing surprising. It says some arc is a type. A is an in32. It has got some protocol buffer tags as well as some JSON tags. B is in32. Some replies an in32. Nothing surprising so far. It declares an arith serv arithmetic server interface, which has a single method, sum. And it's got some registration or boilerplate. Now, the client is also included in the same stub file. That .pb.go, that's a stub file. It's got client logic in it as well. So the arithmetic client is there. A way to declare a new client is there. And the sum boilerplate is there. So, what is the implementation like? The first thing I need to do is I need to include gRPC aromatic and I use a shortcut. I call it pb because I don't want to type gRPC slash aromatic. For those of you who don't know this, Go has a way of generating stuff calling external binaries called GoGenerate every time you run this file. So every time I compile this file, it actually regenerates the, the stub file for me so that it's never stale. So that's GoGenerate. I declare a constant. I'm going to use port 551. And here I implement the server. So this is how I implement the server. Some reply input A plus input B and return nil for an error because it takes some reply and error. So that is the server. So how do we actually get the server running? We have a main function here. We first listen to a TCP port, which is port 551, I just declared. I register the arithmetic server. You, it has, gRPC has reflection capability, so you can ask, what does this structure look like? So I, I register the structure, the server, to the reflection service as well. I run the server on the listening port. If everything's fine, it just runs and waits forever. So let's run the gRPC server. Yeah. Let's run the GPR, gRPC server. So right now it's compiling gRPC. It's taking a long time and the gRPC server is up and running. How does the client work? 
Again, you import the generated stub file, the generated package, PB. It makes a connection, create a new client. C now creates a new client. And I have to provide a background context. Background context means uh, I don't know about cancellations, I don't know about timeouts. Uh, it's just the default. Uh, do what, what you will context. And I pass it uh, some arcs, three and four. And if I run the client, it says, come on, run. Seven. Now, let's shut down the server. GRPC server is running. Let's shut down the server. What will happen when I run the client now? Any guesses? Well, let's run it. Let's run it. Google has uh, given some very nice error messages. Could not compute some RPC error, code unavailable, description. All sub connections are in transient failure. Sorry, we'll be right back soon. <laughs> Connection error, description transport, error when dialing this port, connection refused. Wow, that's a really nice error message from Google. Run the server again. Run the client again. Come on, and it's back. Compare this with NetRPC. NetRPC, okay. Where are we? Message bus, message bus, so far back. Ah, there we are. Let's shut down the NetRPC server. And let's run the client against a non-existent server. And all it says in the Go Net RPC package is, sorry, I can't connect to the server. Connection refused. Less verbose error message, but effectively the same thing. So that actually concludes my talk. If you want this code, it's on my GitHub page. Uh, it's GitHub Suyin. So you can download this presentation, other presentations I've made as well. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what, what about message bus? If we will, uh, if we will shut down uh, message bus. Ah, so, okay, uh, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's kill the message bus. It's a message broker. Okay, let's not kill the message broker. Let's kill the message bus server. The message bus server is closed. So effectively, What's happening here is somebody is writing to the whiteboard. It will write successfully, but nobody is looking at it. Let's see what happens. And we will, we will not have any error messages in this case. Yep. It should not have any error messages. But it wow. has. Why? Let me show you. I said, if you don't get a reply within one second, oh. say time out. Okay. Please don't wait forever. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions? No? Yes? What the, sorry. No, no. What okay. are the benefits uh, of the GRPC compared to NetRPC? The performance of GRPC compared to NetRPC? Now, what, what's the, what the benefits? Ah. Because I saw like uh, there are some abstractions of the proto, okay. uh, but in my opinion, it seems a bit uh, heavy. It's a hassle. Yeah. All right. I would go to GRPC if I were in a polyglot programming environment. In other words, um, if I got some clients writing in Python, if I got some clients writing in Ruby, GRPC is perfect there. Um, it's got streaming. 
net RPC doesn't have streaming. Mm. So it's good there. But there's a cost to pay. The, the interface definition file is not that bad. You have to compile the thing. It's not that bad. Uh, and it's usable, I mean, from the demo, you can see. It's not too bad. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you.